Watch it! So, let me get this straight. Junkrat came at you? I always knew he was a fuckboy. Oh, hey, hey, oh, hey, I was, uh, <laughs> doing the review the whole time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's me. Okay, um, so, look at me. I'm standing. Boom! Big reveal. Damn it, I told myself no Rick and Morty references. Anyway, this finale review is one week too late. I know, I know. Had some camera problems, the old rebel needed some repairs, and I just couldn't film yet. But I'm back in black, or gray, with the... Reinhardt logo. Alright guys, this is it. I want to start by patting myself on the back for avoiding spoilers because I couldn't watch the episode for a few days. Plus, more than likely, this review is already out after the first 500 have been released, so it's probably kind of redundant. Anyway, we got an hour and 20 minutes of Game of Thrones this week. Let's get right into it. Stones will be turned over. Loose ends will be tied. Bodies will roll. Maybe a cameo by a certain zombie dragon by chance? Sisters will probably go toe to toe. Or should I say, little finger to mini assassin? Can a dickless Greyjoy regain his honor? Will a certain wolf enter a certain dragon's castle, if you know what I mean? Obviously, there's plenty more to be answered. All in 80 minutes, so let's begin. Grey Worm and the Unsullied are camped outside of King's Landing, waiting for their leaders to arrive. Bronn and Jaime stand atop the Parapets looking at the army. Of course, once again, Braun feels like he has to force a joke to lighten the mood by commenting on the Unsullied and their lack of dicks. But once again, the Dothraki comes storming in and Braun goes back to we are fucked mode. I swear to God if Braun isn't alive by the end of this. Well, I mean... Would anybody care? Not like he's done anything special recently. All he ever does is shit talk Jamie and pop weird little funny quips all the time. I will say for sure, if he continues to stick around Jamie this time, that is definitely gonna get him killed. If the Starks or Jamie don't kill him, the army of the dead will for sure. No time to talk about that now when John and Tyrion are approaching the shore, where they see all the ships donning Euron's flag floating over Blackwater Bay. Now I know I comment a lot on how all the weird connections are being made this season and everyone is getting reunited in a certain Certain way, but John sailing towards King's Landing, all dressed up in his best winter ball outfit? Kinda weird. Down in the bowels of the ship, the Hound examines the box that they're keeping the white in that they had captured. And for a fourth goddamn time, he has to fuck with it. Clegane, what the hell, man? Don't you remember what happened last time you did this? You nearly got the bearded ginger killed. Everybody loves the bearded ginger. I swear, this guy touches more things he shouldn't be than David in Prometheus. Maybe that's how he can defeat his brother if they ever win at it. Just poke or nudge him a few times. Maybe throw a rock at his head. The group makes their way towards a place appropriately called the Dragon Pit. Kind of funny we've been in King's Landing for seven seasons now and we've never heard of this place. Where the King in the North rendezvous with the Sapphire of Tarth. And let's not forget Podrick and his magic cock. Which, once again, Braun has to joke about. As if that wasn't a happy enough moment for you all, the Hound and Brienne come together and they discuss how Arya is still alive and well at Winterfell. I think I speak for everyone when I say this is the Hound at his most vulnerable state. Giving Brienne the respect she deserves after that fist fight that they had. To think three years ago, the woman he's smiling at, Mike Tysoned his ear back in season four. Plus, finally admitting he did care for Arya and was looking after her the whole time. And let's not forget that little smile he gives off at the end of their exchange. He really is a snuggly bear deep down. God, I love him. And just like that, I signed his death warrant, didn't I? Still, the happy moments keep coming when Tyrion and Bronn finally catch up. And Bronn keeps emanating his... Braunness. I know, I know, I'm talking a lot about Bronn. But he does have a lot of funny moments in the first ten minutes. As much as I critique it, it's pretty good. Almost felt necessary, but still kind of redundant. So as the group arrives at the Dragon Pit, Braun takes Podrick to inevitable safety, probably due to his lack of plot armor. As all the ducks get in a row and they hear the Lannister cavalry approach, the Hound tells Tyrion this is a fucked up and stupid idea. Proving his own point when the fear cascades over his face as the Queen approaches with the Mountain at her side. Brienne and Jaime share a discerning but caring look. Euron and Theon make eye contact. Theon still looking like a pussy, unfortunately. And then, the moment we've been looking forward to the last few years. Clegane versus Clegane. And it's not very exciting. Which is fine, the Hound intimidates him a little bit, says what he needs to say, and that is it. And that is all I was looking for. Because the real action is about to start. Just when we think Daenerys isn't gonna be a part of this, Drogon comes stomping into the appropriately named pit and Daenerys descends from the saddle. He makes his way towards the circle of inevitable friendships as Cersei watches on. What was it she said in season four again? Baby dragons. How bitchy do you feel now, Cersei? 
Do you even have feelings? Tyrion starts by saying the obvious, that everybody in this room hates each other and probably wants to kill everyone else. Game of Thrones in a nutshell. Euron starts talking shit on Theon, probably thinking he's gonna be the easiest to break on Jon's team. But Tyrion shuts him down with a really good roast, surprisingly bringing back that quick wittiness that we have missed from earlier seasons. And Theon even stands up for himself a little bit. Quick development that caught me by surprise, but it was enjoyable seeing Theon add to Tyrion's insults. Which is the way I like my GOT development. The Hound brings the zombie out of a gladiator-style door and lets him loose. After a very long pause in which the white appears to be dead dead, raising the tension higher and higher, but thankfully the white turns out to be very much alive. And then begins what I like to call the Game of Thrones TED Talk. Starting with a personal 4D virtual experience for Queen Cersei, when the White charges out of the box and gets within inches of Queen Cersei's face. Followed by a philosophical exercise featuring Sandor Clegane, who demonstrates how every part of your body is alive and has value, when he hacks the White to bits, betraying this metaphor by every arm and leg still being alive after it's been removed from the body. Which I like to add, Kyburn is orgasming over when he picks up one of these hands. And then concludes with Jon Snow explaining how everything in life will have some given meaning at any point in time. Like fire or dragon glass, for example, and how they are their best weapons against the army of the dead. And then... It works. Cause get this, Cersei actually listens. She swears allegiance to the party as a whole and will fight in the great war that's coming? She promises not to choose sides as long as anybody else does, giving a slight nudge towards the king in the north. Oppositely though, Euron decides to run away back to Pike like the little bitch he actually is. Hey Cersei, your master of the seas is walking away, you're not gonna execute him, no death, okay. Turns out Cersei does have a condition in this fight that she will fight as long as Jon Snow doesn't pick sides. Just when everything is hunky-dory and John can make this really easy on everybody. God damn it, John. He woefully expresses his undying loyalty to Daenerys. Causing the truce to break down in shambles. And it's Ned Stark's honor all over again. Do you want to die, Jon? Are you trying to get your head cut off as well? Tyrion pulls a brawn, expressing how truly, royally fucked they are after Cersei leaves. And Jon continues to be a dumbass, sticking with his honor and his oath. Preaching how we mustn't tell lies or we'll just be as bad as the bad guys. Jon, baby, let me tell you something. This is Game of Thrones, there are no good guys or bad guys. Seriously, did you get that scratched in your hand by Dolores Umbridge or something? However, Tyrion actually has a solution. And off we go as the Mountain escorts the Dwarf to Cersei's office. Where just outside, he runs into his brother Jaime. Brother and brother both say goodbye once again as they both agree that they are both complete idiots. And just like that, I'd like to think the development between Jaime and Tyrion has come full circle. Everything Jamie thought Tyrion was, or tried to convince himself he was, in this simplest moment, Jamie realizes Tyrion is just his brother, nothing more. After they part ways, Tyrion steps into the lion pit. I can only imagine, in this moment, people all around the world were gripping their TV screens tightly and their hearts were bumping in their chest. I got $500 at Tyrion last 35 seconds. As Tyrion approaches, Cersei just sits there menacingly. Almost as if she'd cut his head off if he just farted in her general direction. Then begins a very in-depth and strongly characterizing argument between brother and sister. Cersei talks down on Tyrion for killing Tywin, and Tyrion continues to defend his own honor by trying to convince Cersei that Tywin wanted him dead from the moment he was born. And just when I think Tyrion's about to beat his record for lasting the longest in a room with another Lannister, he actually starts goading Cersei into killing him. Wait. He's not dead? He's drinking wine. Well, even though he goaded her, instead of the mountain crushing our favorite dwarf like a pancake, Cersei reveals to Tyrion that she's pregnant. <laughs> Back at the dragon pit, Jon looks at 300 plus year old dragon bones. Dragon bones that are centuries old, just sitting right there on the surface, not buried or fossilized. Daenerys approaches him, and even though she chastised him earlier, she explains that she understands why he expresses loyalty to her. It's because of the power of boners. They discuss Daenerys' ancestors and the history of the Targaryens, and how dragons were considered a miracle in gods among men. They were big, massive, and meant a whole lot in the world. That's cool. I know something else big and massive that means a whole lot in the world. Elephants! 
They're so adorable, and I love how they do that thing where they hug you with their trunks. Danny talks about how her family is gonna fade away with the last of her dragons. John argues that they won't because she is still alive. And Daenerys' boner only gets bigger when she admits she should have trusted him sooner. John himself confesses that since he said what he said, they are royally fucked. And they both have a good laugh about it. Tyrion returns looking very restrained, followed by Cersei who's looking just as determined. Oh god, what's gonna happen? Clegane Bowl? Jon's beheading? Is Tyrion gonna drop dead from poisoned wine? Nope! Cersei proudly announces that she will again fight alongside Jon and Daenerys in the Great War. And her bargaining chip is that she wants them to remember that she helped. So... Cersei, Jaime, Tyrion, Danny, Davos, the Clegane's, Jorah, Jon Snow, the King in the North, and so many more fighting alongside each other. This is gonna end badly. Yet that alone is gonna make season eight amazing. Cause think about it, all the conflicts, all the intertwining plots and politics, everything the show has been about has been wiped away clean in a mere 15 minutes. And you know why? Because it doesn't mean shit. When you have a hundred thousand zombies marching your way. I am totally cool with that. Unfortunately, the moment's cut short. Cause we still got stuff to take care of in Winterfell. Where Littlefinger continues to play games with Sansa. And Sansa's paranoia only getting bigger after Arya's indirect threats. Littlefinger makes his next big power play. When he goes Sansa into thinking that Arya wants the title of Lady of Winterfell for herself. Are we really building up this three-way conflict triangle between two sisters and the deadliest virgin in all of Westeros? Anyway, scene doesn't really last that long. I guess it's not going anywhere. Back at Dragonstone, John and Danny decide to ride to Winterfell in the same boat with only one cabin and one bed to share between them. <laughs> Apparently it'll send a better message if they arrive together. Instead of Danny landing smack dab in the middle of the Winterfell courtyard on top of a dragon, Theon approaches John as he's leaving the courtyard, still asking for a pity party from the Starks after all he's done to them. John says Theon needs to forgive himself and be a part of the team. Instead of all that, Theon claims he just needs to rescue his sister. John basically tells him to fuck off and do it then. And for good reason... <laughs> Listen to this. Outside, Theon orders his men to prepare to go rescue Yara. And just like every experience he's had with the Ironborn, none of them respect him. Most notably, the first mate, who starts beating Theon senselessly. And of course, Theon keeps taking the hits. This guy keeps saying he'll kill Theon if he keeps getting up. This goes on for quite a while, and I'm thinking Theon is just gonna go out like the little bitch we all think he is. And just like Tormund's near-death experience beyond the wall, just when we think Theon's gonna kick the bucket, Theon instead gets kicked right in his pleasure spot. Now. This would have hurt. It hurt me that much, I'll tell you that. But not so much for Theon since his nether regions aren't exactly there. <laughs> Ever. These writers had some serious balls to put something like that in there. I mean, we're talking slapstick you'd find in a Judd Apatow movie, but here it is in Game of Thrones. After that glorious moment, Theon literally baptizes himself with ocean water, and just like that, our beloved Ironborn turned traitor, turned sex slave, turned right hand man to his sister Yara, Theon Greyjoy is back, baby. Sansa summons Arya to the Great Hall of Winterfell. With Littlefinger in the corner thinking his latest and greatest plan is about to unfold, Sansa prepares to sentence Arya for her treachery. And the winner for biggest fake out and best Jenga Tower death goes to... Peter Baelish! <laughs> Peter Baelish, come on down and claim your prize, you traitorous son of a bitch. Whom everyone has apparently forgotten betrayed one of the most beloved Game of Thrones characters of all time. Whom for some reason still has a fan base up to season 7. How stupid do you think all Littlefinger fans feel right now? Can we get that sweetness three more times? Who knew that sooner or later this dude's plans were gonna start unfolding on their own? Me personally, I saw it coming when he held the knife to Ned's throat. To be honest, I'm not surprised. The way this show has been playing out, it's starting to feel like all the shocking good guy deaths were pretty much well spent, and we're actually getting into the nitty gritty of a story with an actual protagonist and an actual antagonist. All of the humans versus the Night King. Not to mention Bran's ability. Magic! 
may I remind you, is what brought down the finger here. Soon as I knew he was the new three-eyed raven, this omnipotent know-it-all power, politics and plots and all this conniving shit wasn't gonna last. Had to bring back the trauma in his big sister, of course. But wasn't it worth it, Sansa? Looking back, I'm actually starting to realize that he may have reminded her of her trauma just so she could understand who was truly behind it all. So he wouldn't have to convince her to turn against Littlefinger in the future. So many good things in this scene. I want to go into all of it. But all I can say... Sheer brilliance. I was stupid to think Arya and Sansa were actually gonna go at it with each other. Before we move on, I need every glorious moment of this scene all together in one. I beg you. I loved you more than anyone. <laughs> the man who started it all. Cut down, literally, in his prime. Maybe passed it a little. Cersei and Jaime return to the Red Keep. Jaime argues that regardless, they're fucked whether the living or the dead come out of this war. Since the Lannister family will be pretty much despised for all time no matter what the outcome. Cersei has had enough of her brother's cynicism when she almost orders the mountain to cut her brother's head off. I imagine a lot of people's hearts sunk into their feet when they saw the mountain reaching for his blade. You see this bottom lip here? I nearly bit this sucker off when Jaime started walking away and Cersei gave the order. May I remind you, she gave the order. She told the mountain to kill him. Him. And yet somehow Jamie's head remained on his shoulders. You know for a show that really throws us for a loop with the unexpected deaths? Season 7 has been excruciatingly generous and I'm terrified of it. For all we know, this means the death count could be above the average quota for Season 8. Lots of main characters still, lots of deaths to be had. Anyway, dear old Samwell returns to Winterfell and discusses with Bran his discoveries at Old Town. Bran quiets him down and casually explains to him how he pretty much knows everything and anything. And then begins to unravel the big mystery behind Jon's birth. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the all-new Bruegel. Bruegel. Tired of skimming through aisles and aisles of old scrolls trying to find the answer to your questions? Well, skim no more, because now there's Bruegel. Bruegel. A revolutionary new codex for all your is my best friend actually a Targaryen needs. Turns out not only did Rhaegar actually love Lyanna, but they had an annulled marriage which Sam confirms to Bran. The real kicker is that Lyanna actually whispered the name Aegon Targaryen to young Ned Stark when she gave birth to him. Bran says they need to tell Jon right away. Yeah, Bran, good idea. Go ahead and tell your half-brother that he is now fucking his aunt. Oh, geez, they really are fucking, aren't they? Oh yeah, Jon and Danny are getting it on in the bone zone, so my want to put the kids to sleep. Sansa and Arya stand atop the parapet at Winterfell and agree never to fight over little minute things like who's going to kill who. Yeah, because that's totally a minute thing to fight over. All right, all right, enough of this loose end crap. I want to get to the ending. Tormund Giants Bane and Beric Dondarrion stand atop the wall. Crows flying around, an obvious symbol that something joyous and happy is coming their way. That'd be the case if it was opposite day, ladies and gentlemen, since pouring out the trees comes the very thing we've been waiting for all seven seasons. As the Horn of the Night's watch blows three times to indicate White Walkers. We see White Walkers, zombies, zombie giants, more zombie polar bears. Oh yeah, and how could we possibly forget? <laughs> Sorry, May. I have no words. I mean, you saw it yourself, right? John's right. We're fucked. We're fucked! We're fucked. We're fucked. We are totally fucked. I'm calling it. All those lovely main characters we were just talking about, about 90% of them are dead. Just completely dead. There's no way more than half the cast is gonna get out of this thing alive. The Starks are all dead. Maybe a self-sacrifice from Jon. You can kiss Brienne and Tormund goodbye. Hound's gonna get torn apart by zombies. Jamie's gonna stab Cersei in the back only to get roasted alive by zombie Viserion. I mean, you can't tell me that wasn't foreshadowing when he charged head on towards Drogon and almost got roasted. Better hop to rewatching the entire series now, ladies and gentlemen, because we're about to say goodbye to a lot of lovable people. I knew the generosity in this season was for something, but that being said, you can't deny it's gonna be awesome. This is what the show has been ramping up to. It was glorious enough seeing the dragons fully grown and torching and burning everything, but now we have the Night King tearing down the friggin wall. The wall, the magical ice barrier that separates us from them. And the Night King tore it down in less than 60 seconds. Secretary from Ferris Bueller, how did you put it again? You're fucked. 
I, I can't beat that. No amount of humor or jokes or grown up gags is gonna top this finale in its entirety altogether. Quit while you're ahead, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I say. I mean, the fuck am I doing making YouTube videos? That finale made me feel so inferior. I'm an embarrassment to my kind. I need to completely revamp my image and move to Idaho and change my name to Pinza Rolafio. Did I go too far for this joke? Okay, but real talk. I'm pretty sure this is what I and everyone else has exactly been looking for. I can't say that I'm too excited, but then again we just have under two years to prep our hearts and our anuses for the heartbreak and fuckery we're going to experience when season 8 comes out. And I'm not going to lie, no amount of death or homages or funny one-bit jokes are going to help me talk about it. Alright, before you all click off, I guess I gotta put some kind of reviewy stuff in this video. Visuals, outstanding. Pacing, relinquishing. Cinematography also outstanding because I guess that also counts as visuals. Writing. Fantastic. I never was really picky for the stuff this show has been criticized for. Oh, <coughs> Sand Snakes. But let's all remember, they all went out exactly the same way they went in. Desert and snow biomes never really mix, so good riddance to them, I say. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Never have I seen something so difficult yet so fun to watch. And watching and writing notes for these reviews has always been an engagement. And yet I still can include everything I want in one video to make it actually watchable. I just really liked this finale. What more else is there to say? There's nothing I'd want to change. I hope fans enjoyed it, and if any of you did, please, that's what the comment section is for. Actually, no, it's for flaming and people being douchebags to each other. I know my friends liked it. I mean, the ones who actually watched it, and those who didn't. I mean, what are you doing watching my review video for having seen it? Anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. There was a lot more I wanted to go into, but I'll be honest. This was the last video needing to be done before I had other projects and ideas for Echo Grande. I'm talking major changes to my YouTube stuff, as well as some group projects which are yet to be conceived. But they are definitely being discussed, I can guarantee that. For now, what I can't say is that I'm part of a podcast with a good friend of mine. It's called Digital Leftovers. We have a few episodes out right now, and we have big plans for the next one, which will be out sooner rather than later. There will be a button on the end screen for you to click to get to that, and I assure you, you won't be disappointed. Besides that, I wish you all a fantastic Morty Gumbus, and keep your ear to the grindstone. Whatever that means, 90s Ben Affleck and Goodwill Hunting. I'll check you later, and you know what's coming at you. My name is Matt, and I'm gonna go destroy Pink Floyd's 11th album. Get it? Because it's called the wall, and the wall just... Oh, nothing. Alright, see ya.